Funding for Overheard with Evan Smith is provided in part by Hilco Partners, Texas Government Affairs Consultancy, and its global healthcare consulting business unit, Hilco Health, and by the Matson McHale Foundation in support of public television, and also by MFI Foundation, improving the quality of life within our community, and also by the Alice Clayburgh Reynolds Foundation. And viewers like you, thank you. I'm Evan Smith. He's a gifted actor whose credits over a more than 30-year career include Twister, One False Move, Weird Science, Titanic, Tombstone, and Apollo 13. But legions of wannabe sister wives know him as bigamist Bill Henriksen on HBO's Big Love, which is about to end a marvelous five-year series run. He's Bill Paxton. This is Overheard. Is that a vote you'd like to have back now? Because you're a judge or a justice in your case doesn't mean that you're free of, of personal opinions about them. You have a dimmer view of him than you have of President's past. So when they take your name in vain, you just laugh it off. For the larger issue, though, in your mind, is that it's not about whether there ought to be a death penalty, but whether the death penalty as administered is fair. Bill Paxton, welcome. Thank you. So great nice to, to see here. you again. Well, it's nice to be seen. And great to have you back in Texas. It's great to be back. So this is for the Texas Medal of Arts ceremony. You'll be awarded the Medal of Arts tonight along uh, with a bunch of other great people. But for you, at the end of a you know, five-year run of big love and uh, looking at the wonderful career you've had, it must be a great thing to get this medal. It's, it's a great honor to be recognized by one's state. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad somebody will claim me. Oh, well, I, I, don't, I think there'll probably be a scrum where I'll be fighting uh, to claim you, actually. I don't so. know. You, what do, what, do you, what do you what do you think is the uh, is the significance of Texas in your career or in your formulation as an actor? Obviously, you've lived away for a while, but you did spend your childhood. Oh, my here, childhood right? and my teenage years, yeah. I was born and raised in in and around Fort Worth, Texas, right. and um, I think your childhood really defines you in so many ways. There's things that that just they're they're in your DNA from where you grow up. I yeah. think it has to do with the, also the. The giant vistas of Texas and being able to see a long way. And yep. uh, I also was uh, lucky to grow up in a town that had a lot of opportunities there. There was great theater at TCU right. when I was growing up there. And, and uh, um, oh gosh, the art museums there are, are world class. Was this always the, the career for you? Did you always I think? I think it was because of my dad. I've, I've, ta I've talked about my dad at length and, and my mother as well, but my father was quite a flamboyant character. Um, he was in a family lumber business. The reason I was born in Fort Worth was uh, my grandfather started a hardwood lumber company in Kansas City yep. back in the, I guess during the First World War. Uh, and eventually it kind of grew through the Midwest and he was gonna he was thinking about putting a yard down in Dallas a distribution yard but he uh, was reading the Saturday Evening Post one night in Kansas City in his study and he saw an article about a flamboyant Texan uh, business entrepreneur by the name of Eamon Carter from Fort Worth and he decided to put the yard down there and that's how I ended up my literally dad, that was it that's it I yeah. mean, my dad decided uh, his he, uh, my grandfather passed and my dad when about the same time my my mom and dad got married and he decided to come down here and live and he was the manager of the yard in Fort Worth for many years. Yeah. But my dad's passion was uh, plays and art and movies. So from a very early age, uh, he'd take me and my older brother, my kid brother, my kid sister, they had to stay home uh, on Friday nights because they were too young. So my dad would take us to events and uh, he would come out of a movie and he would be deconstructing it. He'd be talking about the camera work or the lighting or the or the, the costumes. Yep. And so for a very early age I was I was drawn to the illusion, the artifice of film mm -hmm. and, and plays. Right. Process, and, not just substance. Yeah. And yeah. I and I guess I kind of fell in love with the magic of that. And uh it's great. eventually I got sucked into the vortex of Hollywood and yeah. Well, I want, to talk about, I, want, I, I want to talk about the vortex because the vortex, vortex took you to very interesting places. But let's start actually at the at the present moment with with big love, since we're Certainly. sitting here today just in the you know a few weeks away. In fact, when this program airs, it'll just be a couple days before the series finale oh, of Big boy. Love. So, of course, I'm expecting that you're going to tell us how it ends. Of course. Um, you're going to give us the big love. I, I, I had a dream that, you know, a twister. Goes over Utah and turns all your sister wives into Kelly LeBrock. That would be science. Something. Wouldn't that be a kind of a great wow. ending? Wow, you know? that'd be great fantasy uh, but, but ending. There, there, there must be there must be a great uh, uh, there must be a great thing coming, and it's been a great series, so I would expect nothing less. 
Yes, it will not be an ambiguous ending yep. uh, like The Sopranos. We're not leaving. We don't speak ill of the dead, but I. That's oh, they're right, a great, yeah. show. great show. Uh, probably the reason I did Big Love was because of The Sopranos. Yep. I was such a fan of that show. But I think they might be leaving it open for a movie or something. Here, there's not going to be a big love movie at the end of I this. don't think so. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. But uh, it's been a great odyssey, a great journey. I got involved with this thing six years ago. When I first heard about Big Love, uh, my agent called me and said, there's a pilot uh, HBO's doing. Yep. Tom Hanks' company's producing it. And you and Hanks go back a long way. We go back to Apollo 13. Right. And it was a... Then I'm hearing it's about this polygamist who's and then in Utah, and then I started thinking, oh, you know, I am a regionalist, and uh, I've always, you know, sounded like where I came from, but uh, I thought, was this guy going to be some kind of um, misogynistic, you know, right. religious zealot who kind of living outside the city limits and barbed wire and it's right. really dry and armed guards and, and all a thing, bunch yeah. of w pregnant women and barefooted and chickens. <laughs> I don't, I, you yeah. know. I, so I, I, and then I read the piece and I realized it was, it was a, a very clever metaphor for so many things. Yep. This was like a way of t taking all, all, all the issues of, of you know, mores of social um, contemporary society in terms of marriage and uh, sex and religion and, and, and done in this very clever way. Here's this guy, he's got these three wives. Uh, it, sounds, you know, it, it sounds like a guy's fantasy, right? Wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yes, if you watch the show, wrong, you know, I, he, he kind of became like a Job-like character. Yeah. Oh, yeah. my gosh. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a burden more than anything else, Oof. isn't it? Yeah, I know. And the show has evolved over these five years to the point where you now are in public office in, in, uh, in, in Utah. Well, at the end of last season, my character last season. ran for, this, uh, for the state senate and yeah. won and yeah. then decided this would be the time to come, come, go out in the open, go yeah. public with his, his private life. And yeah. uh, he's finding that in this new season to be a bit, uh, I think he underestimated just how bit much of a animosity there right. is out there for people who do sex. It's like interesting that over the years well. that you've done this program, we've seen actually the, you know, not just one, but now prospectively in this cycle, two Mormon political candidates, actually Mitt, Mitt Romney Mitt in the Romney, last cycle, yeah. and now Mitt <clears throat> Romney and John Huntsman, the former governor of Utah. Mm -hmm. How much of that is a coincidence? I mean, did you, did you all watch Romney in the last cycle and think this would be an interesting thing to put... This uh, character you'd have public. to ask the creators that yeah. question. You had no hand in this no, development. No, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. no, not really. We would talk between seasons. We would, I'd get together with Mark Olson and Will Sheffer. They're the two creators of Big Love, and we would say, "Okay, where have we come? Yep. Where where do we think we're going? What, what avenues are we going to explore?" It was right. it was more general. Right. The other thing that's happened in the last couple of years, I guess, is Warren Jeffs, who we in Texas know. You know Warren but, Jeffs, yeah, doesn't he have a, a place nearby? Uh, it's not, it's not that, not that close. What was that place called? <laughs> it was well, El Dorado was. Uh, El Dorado, it was, but it, 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 like it, a... it was in El Dorado, Texas. But oh, the, yeah. it was the, the point is though that again, sort of a life imitating art or art imitating well, life. You know? Weirdly enough, he kind of became on the national radar about yeah. the same time the show came on. Yeah. So we were kind of a, we were weirdly ahead of that. Mm -hmm. And then as that became a big news story, I think the creators certainly drew from that. Right. I think most people, you know, didn't have a lot of, uh, I don't know, of really much understanding of, of, of uh, the Mormon religion and its history. Yep. I, uh, you see, in, back in the 18, it was a Utah territory, and back in the 1890s, they wanted statehood, and they only was, the way they'd be granted statehood if, if they abolished polygamy. So this caused a big rift. You got to yeah. remember, these are people that, that pioneered out to the middle of a wasteland, uh, and to, so that they could uh, create a religious utopia. You know, it was a freedom of religion. Yep. That's why a lot of people came to this country. Uh, I know some of my ancestors yep. were uh, religiously persecuted and, had, and came here, and so I've, I've had a lot of admiration for them. So they had to make this split, and that caused a lot of problems. But I feel like. Uh, they, sh you know, they should be proud of, of that heritage. Yeah. You know, well, you and, have learned a lot about it, actually. Oh, I've learned sure. so much about o it yeah. over the yeah. over the course yes, of the program. Yes, absolutely. Uh, what's the difference between HBO, yeah. being on HBO, and being in movies in terms of how people re regard you out in the world when you run into people now? Is there something about being on an HBO program that's a different experience as an actor from? Well, I, I don't want to sound like a snob, but I never really had uh, any intention of, of doing a, a television series. To me, uh, most television series, if they're on a network TV, 
you've got so many cooks in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. You've got so many people you've got to satisfy. And then on top of that, to have commercial interruptions. Right. Uh, it's, you know, you're watching something, you're invested in it, and all of a sudden they're selling so soap, opportunities soap had come powder. up before for you to do television and you turn them away? I turned them down. I had a yeah. very comfortable career in yep. features. Uh, I, I wanted to be in features because every image in a feature film is lit, art directed, costumed. It, and what attracted me to HBO was that it really was home box office. Yep. They built their they built their uh, reputation on doing movie quality yep. work, and to me that was all about the fidelity of the image, in terms of of how it was shot and how how it was put together. Has the experience been a good one for you, and that you would consider doing it again if they if somebody came back to you with a uh, program? I don't like know this? if I have the stamina to do that again, yeah. but uh, I. I don't. I, I. It's been a great experience, particularly working with such great actors, and, yep. and we became an acting company. Mm -hmm. uh, Gene Triplehorn, uh, who plays Barb, and Chloe Sevigny, who plays Nikki, and Jennifer Goodwin. These are actresses at the top of their They're game. They're terrific. And Harry Dean Stanton. Harry was Dean so Stanton. Great. Uh, this season, I'm. I tell you, who's really just blowing my socks off is Grace Zabriskie, who plays my yeah. mother. Her character slowly going into dementia. Yeah. She's been an amazing character actress, underappreciated, oh. but David Lynch has made such great use of her and things over the years. I too. think this is the best thing she's yeah, ever she's been Yeah, she's fantastic. In. Let's go back to the beginning. I want to ask you about two influences on you early in your career, very different, but both iconic in their own way, Roger Corman and mm. Stella Adler. Mm. So Corman was the first real connect to Hollywood that you had, coming out from this Fort part of the country yeah. out, out west. Talk about Corman, if you would, and your relationship, please. Well, uh... Actually, the man who I worked for, Peter Jamison, just just passed away. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. uh, he was an art director directing his art directing his first movie for Roger Corman. It was back in 1974. It was a movie called Big Bad Mama. It starred uh, Angie Dickinson, Dickinson right, William yeah. Shatner, Tom Skerritt. Kind of one of those Linda great Pearl. terrible movies, right? So, yeah. yeah, I got on in the art department yep. uh, because I was hired because I I knew about periods of furniture. I knew about drapery and stuff a guy from Texas probably shouldn't know about. Well. <laughs> but my father, you know, most of the, in there the wood go. business, it was interior woods. They weren't selling building material. They were selling, you know, woods that were made into furniture and stuff. And my dad loved architecture too, so I knew about a lot of that. Yeah. So I was able to kind of BS my way into this job and uh, I got paid $25 a day. But the thing I didn't realize was, I didn't realize how spread out Los Angeles was. My job was to drive this 20-foot van collecting set dressing, and this was a 1930s film. Mm -hmm. And at the time, the 30s had become very popular. They were, at the same time, they were making about five period films from that era. There were, the Day of the Locust was in production, another movie called Lepke, yep. and I uh, forget the other ones. And so it was and we had a lower budget, so it was very tough to kind of get this set dressing, but I didn't realize that MGM was in Culver City. Universal was over here in Burbank. Paramount was over here in Hollywood, and to try to coordinate, and I really almost had a nervous break. You're spending all your time in the van, right? That's it. And freaking out because yeah. I feel like I'm completely <laughs> screwing up this job, and this guy yeah. really needs me to come clean, but by the end of that three months, I worked for 12 weeks without a day off. Yeah. But I didn't even think about it. I didn't have a life out there mm -hmm. to miss. You had come out to make your life. I didn't out know there, any right? girls out there. I didn't know anybody out there. Yeah. I had no no connection out there. So uh, so I thank thankfully I did have work. Yeah. But by the end of that three months, I knew that town like the back of my hand. What's the thing about, about Corman? Because you know we all have this image of Corbin. Well, he's, you know, Roger Corman's always, you know, he's been lauded by the guy that gave so many great filmmakers their chance. Yep. And, and that's true, but, but really, in my memory of him, he was the only guy doing non-union films. So he's like, if you were an immigrant coming off the boat, he was the guy who'd give you a job, you know, picking fruit, you know, for really no money or any or any benefits. So this is not as positive a memory as I was expecting. It was a bit of an exploit. <laughs> exploit. You send him to Wisconsin, actually, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I, mean, he, I never really got to know him much. Yep. Uh, he wasn't around the set too much. But the experience of being on that film, though, was important. One from thing the I, I learned, I learned to yeah. get, you know, about getting. A, a, a lot of mileage for a buck. Yep. And that to me is important. I've always important been, today, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, more important today than ever, because now the budgets are getting more and more constricted. Right. Yet the cost for everything is going up. Now, 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 you when you went into acting, uh, finally, 
you did take classes from the legendary Stella Adler. Yes, you studied I did. from Stella Adler. Now, again, we all have this notion of Stella Adler having this particular way of training people, but I, I talk from the perspective of somebody who actually well, Stella was Adler a was Marlon Brando's teacher. Right. You know, uh, Marlon Brando said he learned everything from two people: Stella Adler and Elia, uh, Elia Kazan, the director. <clears throat> Uh, I, I had heard about a program. I tried to go to film school, but I had these horrible SAT scores that just haunted me. You know, some test I had to take at 8 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday when I was at 16 that age, years right. old. Yeah. Hung over probably from a beer bust. You know, I, I, <laughs> but it haunted me. I, 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 and I was a little, <clears throat> uh, not bitter, but I was a little upset at the idea that I'd worked professionally in Hollywood for a couple of years. I'd made student films and... I had some money. I tried to go to S USC, and I tried to go to UCLA, and I was turned down by both both of them. And I thought, you know, the hell with film school. This this back then, as a medium, is not even a hundred years old. Uh, I so I decided I really wanted to study acting because right. I felt like that was something you needed to go and learn. It was a craft, a very specific craft, and there was a program that NYU was starting, where you could study at a professional school and take academics towards a, uh, I guess, a, a bachelor's degree. Yep. And I got in that program, and it was Stella Adler. And uh, I wasn't one of her star pupils, I have to say. Uh, but, uh, but you passed. I I don't know if I passed. <laughs> I remember one day Let's she asked me you how I got in her. She didn't. She was kind of said, "How did you get in my class?" At one point, I was like. <laughs> <laughs> but look how you've turned out. It's a lesson for all the kids and struggling, you know, as they go through. Well, I've been persistent. You yeah. have been persistent. Yeah. 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 She could be tough. Yeah. She could be tough. Go, go back tough. over. I know this is impossible <clears throat> to do in just a couple of minutes, but go back over the films you've made. Your career basically do, dates back to 30 years. Yeah. Right. So of the 30 years, uh, pick a moment or two moments that you would say. Oh, I think uh, the confidence I got working for John Hughes as in, in Weird Science yeah. was a great moment for me. I, I think it was the first time I really wasn't terrified in front of a camera. Mm -hmm. But even going back to The Lords of Discipline, which was the first... Well, uh, that's a great film. The first, Directed by Frank Rodham. Uh, I, I, this is kind of a good story. Yeah. I was... Uh, there were, there was based on a Pat Conroy novel, The Lords of Discipline. It was about military cadets at the Carolina Military Institute in the early 60s. And um, I was, it was going to be shot here, but none of the military colleges would give them permission because it had to do with a secret society and hazing yep. and all this stuff. So we ended up in England, and there were about 11 or 12 actors that were taken over, and the rest were Canadian and English actors and mm -hmm. Americans who were living in England. And I was like the last guy to, to, to get on the bus. Uh, I had a minor supporting role, but it was a great, great summer for me. I met my wife that summer, and just a lot of things happened to me. And I loved being in England. But the, on the first day of filming, the first scene I was in, um, there's a scene where it's the, 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 the seniors are coming back. David, uh, David Keith is in it, and... Um, Rick Rosovich and Michael Bean, and they're coming back, and as they're going down a hallway, you see I'm an upperclassman, we're hazing all the freshmen. Yeah. And we're about to shoot the scene, and I remember Frank Rodham coming up to me, and he said, I want to give you a piece of direction. So I'm, I'm just, you know, just eager as hell, give it to me, what is it? He says, I just have one thing to tell you. I said, what's that? He goes, it's a great day for Texas, Bill. It's a great day for Texas. Okay, let's shoot the shot. I even had to say that to me. I yeah. mean, you know. It was wonderful. It's great. Just wonderful. Put you in the right frame of mind. But I've had a lot of yeah. great moments at different times. Uh, when I first started out, there was, you're so worried about what you're doing. Yep. You, you know, you want to be good, of course. We all want to, you know, be good. And, uh, and, and it, unfortunately, that takes you out of the experience. You, 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 you're, you're so worried about what you're doing, you're not present, you're, yep. not, you're not here. Finally, I got beyond that, and I always, and, I, and it became about, there were two experiences to be had. You do the part to your, the best of your ability, you let it go with that, and, and, and you, you're open to this experience you're having, and, and that's why I got in this business in the first place. I was never super athletic. I mean, I was athletic, but I, didn't, I wasn't a quarterback or anything like that. And uh, it really has been a, a, a great honor to be a part of a, to be working with a group of creative adults towards a concerted effort. Mm -hmm. You know, society is so split apart, we're all so isolated, even though we have all this communication, our, we're, we're still, we're more and more isolated. Mm -hmm. And to 
be with a group of people and working on a movie. And to movie, to me, movies, motion pictures, they're one of the last of the great guild crafts. It's almost a renaissance craft where all all these all these disciplines have to come together. Right. To people at different that levels, image. right? Have to join. Different in. levels, different different yeah. departments, and and on a, a great motion picture, you know, to win the, the best picture Oscar. You know, is is a movie that to me rep you see every one of those disciplines, mm -hmm. and there's a great feeling of, of camaraderie, mm -hmm. and it, it's tough. Every day's a battle. You're fighting the budget, the, the schedule, and every the film is different. I mean, I think about every it. Film's different. I think about yeah. it in your career. You know, one of the great films that's on your filmography that I think many Club of us Dread. remember. Not Club Dread. No, I'm going to. I was not going to mention Club Dread, <laughs> but I think One False Move, which was such an early. Early in kind of early for you, or early for Billy. In fact, very early for Billy Bob Thornton. That's right. You know, <clears throat> what a great movie that was. But then, vastly different than Twister, vastly different than Apollo 13, just in terms of scope and yeah. size and ambition. But every bit is high quality a, a film in the end. Yeah, I don't think the scope or scale of, of a story define whether it's going to be a, a good movie or an yeah. okay movie or you know or a great movie. Yeah. Uh, uh, one false move. Well, they were screening that the other night in uh, Los Angeles, and I did a Q and A. Uh, and I ran into Billy Bob recently, and uh, we hadn't seen much of each other in, in, in recent years. I live out in the country, and, and he's been on the road with his band. Yeah. But uh, it was really great to see him. Yeah. And we were actually backstage at the Costume uh, Designers Awards last week, and uh, Samuel Jackson was there. And then I entered, and Gene Triplehorn and Jennifer Goodwin were there, and we realized we were all a bunch of hillbillies. <laughs> uh, I was from Fort Worth, Billy was from Little Rock, right. Samuel Jackson's from Chattanooga, Jenny's from uh, Memphis, and, and Gene's from Tulsa. Yeah. And so we said, what are, the, what are we doing here? How do we all here? end up here? What are we doing Isn't here? Isn't that funny? I've always liked the idea that Hollywood is, 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 uh, is so diverse because all of us are from. You know, there's very few people from California out there in the, yeah. who work in the motion picture business. We're all refugees. Itinerant community. We all ran away and joined the circus. Well, that's yeah. Smart. yeah. We have about yeah. four minutes left. I want to ask you, I want to, we started with Texas, I want to end with Texas. Mm. You and I once before spent a long time talking about the Kennedy assassination. Yes. And in fact, you're in the process right now of producing a project you'd like to be big and broad and ambitious, and we hope it ultimately will be, mm. uh, about what actually happened. Telling not, it as yeah. a human interest story. Human interest, not from the, the, the no, stories we've heard before, yeah. but a, diff a different angle. Based on what right. we know took yeah. place. And yeah. what I've found in my research is there's so much that the average American just doesn't even know. Right. For example, um, Lee Harvey Oswald purchased the rifle to assassinate uh, General Edwin Walker who was a retired general who was the head of the John Birch Society, and uh, actually tried to shoot him. And in his, he was in his study doing his taxes, and Oswald fired from behind the guy's backyard fence. And the only reason he didn't kill the guy is the bullet caught the, the sill going and just, just deflected enough to go right. through, his, through his scalp. Yeah. Uh, people don't realize that. So yeah. when he went down to the, to the book depository that day, he had missed the first time. He wasn't going to miss the second time. Mm -hmm. Jack Ruby is sending, five minutes before he shoots Oswald, he's sending a $25 money gram to one of his strippers in Fort Worth who's called up and said, Jack, I know you've closed the clubs out of deference to the slain president, but I need money for groceries. So you're telling me that's a premeditated murder of a guy who five minutes before is sending, and, yep. the, and the, it's right across the street still. It's a print shop mm -hmm. now the old Western Union officer. We're going to try to tell just things that we know happened. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, it's to me, it's a mystery that will always be contested. Yeah. But here as we come upon the 50th anniversary, we just, we want to just take aspects of, of it and, and, and dramatize right. them for people to go, here's some other pieces of the puzzle right. you might not have. And for you, this is really personal because uh, you're an eight-year-old boy. I saw the on president that On your dad's shoulders. Yes. At the Hotel Texas. The Hotel Texas. The Kennedys came in the night before. Yeah. Uh, they flew in from Houston. They'd been at dinner. They'd had a big day. Yeah. They'd started in Washington that day. They'd been to San Antonio for a whole lunch thing, and then they went down to Houston. And uh, my brother woke up the next morning, my brother Bob, and it was about 7, and he woke my dad up and said, you promised you'd take me and Bill to see the president. So my dad looked out the window. It was raining, and he thought, oh, man, this is going to be kind of a scene with all the people. But yeah. we went down there, and... Uh, 
in about a half hour. It was probably a crowd of about 5,000 people. Uh, Kennedy and, and Johnson and Connolly, all of them came out and uh, and he spoke for about 10 minutes and walked right into the crowd. You remember it very clearly as a... Oh yeah, it was one yeah. of those things you wouldn't forget. <clears throat> I couldn't see very well, so my dad put me up on his shoulders. Uh, and I, suddenly I had like the best yeah. seat in the house. and. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the president was jocular, he was tan, he was in good spirits. He kidded about Jackie taking a little longer to get ready in the morning, but she looked a lot better. And, and there was an electricity in the crowd. A lot of uh, the secretarial pools of yep. the gals from downtown had come out of the offices, and there were a lot of workmen in the, in the crowd. It's a great moment. It was an amazing yeah. moment. So that's the next thing. That'll sort of be the next big Paxton project, we think? Uh, well, we'll see. You know, it's, it's kind of in the, got a movie in the happening budgetary now? stage right now. I've got a couple movies in the hopper. As too. an actor? Yeah, I've got a couple things happening. Well, we welcome you back to the community of feature films. Thank you. Uh, but, uh, but Big Love is great. And uh, so we're excited to watch the season finale and, and just happy to have you back. It'll be unforgettable. All right, Bill. Good to see you. Thanks, Bill Evan. Paxton, thanks very much. Thanks, Bill. Funding for Overheard with Evan Smith is provided in part by Hilco Partners, Texas Government Affairs Consultancy, and its global healthcare consulting business unit, Hilco Health, and by the Matson McHale Foundation in support of public television, and also by MFI Foundation, improving the quality of life within our community, and also by the Alice Kleberg Reynolds Foundation. And viewers like you, thank you.